We don't have monitors, so I'm gonna check this right quick. See how it is. I think it might be cool. So, I wanna go ahead and introduce our next speaker, um, Jeff Flores. He recently was released from a near 23 year sentence in prison. Um, originally faced up to 100 years for the cumulative charges that he was being faced with. And this is one of the more, one of various really blatant, obvious cases of political repression and very politically motivated sentencing. And one, one quote that was described eventually when his sentence was reduced was that it was an international campaign for a more appropriate sentence for a crime in which no one was hurt. And the entire time that, that Jeff was in prison, he wrote extensively and was uh, connected to the activist community and provided an opportunity for people to engage with him. So I'll let him come up and speak more about specifics. say that uh, it was really awesome to see Rob talk. A lot of people may not know this, but me and Rob met in prison, and this is the first time that we've been able to do a speaking event together since uh, we've both been released. And it's really nice to see him on this side of the wall. So, uh, and you. <laughs> so uh, I just got out, just like Trey, about four months ago. So me and him are both experiencing the free world for the first time in a long time. Uh, my co-defendant Craig Critter Marshall and I were the first eco-arsonists that were captured in the U.S. during the still clandestine days of the government's green stare. Uh, beginning as early as 1998, the federal government put together a task force that was headquartered in Eugene, Oregon. And the sole purpose of this task force was to focus on the activities of radical environmentalists. Uh, by early 2000, unbeknownst to me, I had become the target of a sophisticated surveillance team as a result of my forest activism. And in testimony that to this day still remains unclear, no law enforcement agency has ever claimed responsibility for ordering the surveillance of me. Uh, during my trial, no detective or federal agent in my case could recall who had ordered the surveillance. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, after I was sentenced to 22 years and eight months for the conviction of uh, the burning of three trucks at a car dealership and the attempted arson of an oil tanker truck, the prosecutor in my case, Lane County Assistant District Attorney Karen Tracy, had her offices raided by the Oregon State Police. Uh, apparently she was under suspicion of evidence tampering and unethical conduct. In a deal that was never disclosed, she left the DA's office and forever surrendered her bar license and is never allowed to practice law again. In 2007, after six years of direct appeal, the Oregon Court of Appeals overturned my sentence, declaring it illegal and I was resentenced to 10 years, which was the lowest possible sentence given the charges I was convicted of. I served nine and a half of those years. Even pre 9-11, I was tried and accused as a member of a domestic terrorist organization. That one event and that one accusation has defined my life for the last 10 years and will define the rest of my life. What happened in my case and what continues to happen today against a broad spectrum of activists is a classic example of the U.S. counterintelligence program that was first used during the Red Scare in the 1940s and 50s against the Black Panthers in the 1960s and 70s and is continuing to be used against activists today. The application of the terrorist label to activists is being used to distance direct action and civil disobedience from more acceptable and therefore less threatening forms of protest. It has created a division between mainstream groups, grassroots organizations, front lines activists, and the public, which draws energy away from all of our collective struggles. Because terrorism is not just a word, it is a weapon that the government and corporations are wielding to silence all dissent. By branding dissent terrorism, the government deflects attention away from the fact that it's their policies and unwavering support of the corporate agenda that is directly responsible for today's environmental crisis. I find it really odd that those who exploit human beings, animals, and the earth are dignified with such titles as chief executive officer, senator, and president, while those of us who dare to protect life and the health of the environment against the unchecked exploitation of a few profiteers are branded as terrorists. It's a twisted game of semantics, and right now those who monopolize power control meaning. For example, in 2003, William Carr, 
a Texas man prosecutors say is a white supremacist and anti-government radical, pled guilty to the charges of possessing a weapon of mass destruction. Authorities have discovered enough sodium cyanide bombs to kill hundreds of people, machine guns with several hundred thousand rounds of ammunition, 60 pipe bombs, and, a re and several remote control explosive devices disguised as briefcases all in a storage space that he rented. William Pryor was sentenced to 11 years in federal prison, and despite the language of the Patriot Act, William Pryor is not considered a terrorist. He's not a terrorist according to the government, and he's not a terrorist according to the media. Likewise, Joseph Stack, who flew a plane into the IRS building in Texas, is not considered a terrorist. So we know that under the Bush administration, there were several draconian and repressive laws that were put into practice, and the Patriot Act is just one of them. But what many people may not be paying attention to <coughs> is that those same laws, as well as new ones, are being used under the Obama administration to continue to keep dissent silent. Uh, the AETA, which stands for the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, is a case in point of the ongoing repression against activists. The AETA-4, as they've come to be known, uh, are four young people who are picketing the home of an animal experimenter, a clearly nonviolent form of protected protest under the First Amendment. And yet, these four kids were spied upon, had their homes raided, their property seized, and then were arrested and charged with terrorism for this demonstration. Eric McDavid, a young anarchist and environmental activist, who is the victim of his lover, a paid undercover FBI infiltrator named in court documents as Anna, was found guilty of a conspiracy for a plot contrived by her. Eric is serving a 19-year sentence for something that never happened. And he is a convicted domestic terrorist. Marie Mason, a 40-year-old mother of two, who was convicted of conspiracy to commit environmental and animal liberations arsons, was sentenced to 22 years and is a convicted domestic terrorist. I want you to take a moment and let that sink in. I want you to think about what that means. A man can possess a cyanide bomb and not be a terrorist. Another man can fly a plane into a building and not be a terrorist. But if a person interferes with an industry, if what's affected is profit and not lives, then that person's a terrorist. I want you to think about the fact that we live in a police state in which protected speech and protected dissent is now considered terrorism. I want you to think about the fact that this isn't happening under the Bush-Cheney administration. This isn't happening under John Ashcroft or former Attorney General Alberto Gonzalez. This is happening under the Obama administration. This so-called progressive president who handed out public money to the most powerful corporations in the world and bailed on his own campaign promises for public health care. Because you see, it doesn't matter who's in power in this country. Corporate interests, government interests, and the interests of the wealthy will always come first. Profits will always be protected at the cost of our civil liberties, at the cost of our environment, and if necessary, at the cost of our freedom and our lives. And the easiest way for the government to get away with this is through propaganda. The state has created a climate of fear in which all dissent is viewed as a threat and dissenters are labeled as terrorists and imprisoned. Now make no mistake, this repression has not been brought about by those who have resisted. As humanity is increasingly threatened with irreversible harm as a result of corporate and government malfeasance, one becomes invested with the inherent right of resistance. Human conscience allows for and often necessitates that one challenge injustice. Pollution and climate change are injustices that are being perpetuated against all of humanity. The first comprehensive assessment of climate, modern day climate change was published in January 2004. This report found that by 2050, more than one million species could be driven to extinction by climate change. That number comprises a quarter of all known land animals and plants. Sadly, the study further found that much of that loss, more than 10% of all known land species, is irreversible by damage already caused by global warming. The Earth is in its sixth mass extinction phase, the only extinction event in Earth's history to be brought about by one species us. But industry isn't just killing the planet, it's killing us. In 2005, a study of newborn infant blood samples was released. The samples were tested for 413 industrial chemicals. Every single one of these children averaged more than 200 in contaminants in their bloodstream, including mercury, fire retardants, pesticides, and dioxin. What that means is that our children are being born with poisons already contaminating their bodies. 
Every breastfeeding mother's milk on this planet contains traces of dioxin, a known carcinogen. In search for ever bigger profits, world corporations are creating an epidemic of disease and death. And to resist the capitalist system that has brought about this global catastrophe in whatever form, legal or extra-legal, is both right and just. Real change has never been accomplished by obeying the law. Every successful social movement in this country has had prisoners, and how these movements have treated their prisoners has been vital in determining their success and longevity as a struggle. The early suffragists were imprisoned and beaten for daring to demand that women have the right to vote. Thousands of people, both women and men, rallied against this injustice, and a successful movement was born. During the civil rights struggle, hundreds of people were arrested, and some of Martin Luther King Jr.'s most powerful writings were done while he was in jail. And the willingness of these individuals to endure abuse in order to fight injustice moved people around the world. And ultimately, a national campaign forced the federal government into signing the Civil Rights Act. And the examples go on and on. The student movement in the 1960s and 70s, the Puerto Rican independence movement, the American Indian movement, the Black Panther Party, the BLA, the anti-nuclear campaign of the 1980s. Each and every one of these struggles has had prisoners, and they've stood by their prisoners. Because supporting our prisoners is one of the ways a struggle gains legitimacy. Not only amongst our own, but amongst the public. And the government knows this all too well. It's been using the same exact tactics to quash dissent for four decades. The state excels at destroying movements that threaten business as usual. During the 1960s, the government stated its goal was, quote, to expose, disrupt, misdirect, or otherwise neutralize the enemies of the state. That same philosophy is used today against all of our activists. The government doesn't want us to scrutinize their actions in a historical context, because the reason the state is able to attack our movements with impunity is because we have not learned the lessons of the past. The Black Panthers were prosecuted for violating the 1940 Smith Act for plotting insurrection when they became too influential and effective in advocating change. So in the late 60s and early 70s, the government targeted black extremists rather than eco-terrorists or animal rights extremists. They targeted key activists with the use of what was then known as the National Security Index, a watch list keeping track of people to silence. So in the process of researching this speech, I came across an unclassified document on eco-terrorism used by the Department of Homeland Security. Within its 40 pages was a list of 27 known eco-terrorists. Now, Several of these people they know about because we were arrested and convicted. But the really scary thing is, is there's a lot of people on there that don't have a criminal history. They're simply outspoken activists. And this is the unclassified version of this list from two years ago. We have absolutely no idea who's on this list today. Rod Coronado, a former Animal Liberation Front prisoner, appears on this list. When he got out, he went around and he started doing speaking events. He's recently been prosecuted in prison for doing the same thing that I'm doing here today, talking. Trey Arrow and I are both on this list. So I guess we're just gonna have to wait and see what happens with us. The environmental movement has found itself in the state's crosshairs, and it's no coincidence that the attack on eco-activists occurred at the same time that the public was becoming increasingly worried about climate change and other environmental issues. There has been a growing tide of resistance to corporate dominance in the United States, and around the world. And one of the ways that's been manifesting itself is through public demands to rein in industry and reduce greenhouse emissions. Industry, on the other hand, has really powerful economic incentives not to change their business as usual practices. And they've lobbied both the state and federal governments to punish activists as terrorists. And the reason for this is really simple. More and more people are demanding change. And by labeling activists as terrorists, the industry can limit dissent. There's real fear in the government that the popularity of environmentalism could create a backlash against corporate and government agendas. The same document I just referenced, which by the way is titled Eco-Terrorism, Environmental and Animal Rights Militants in the United States, says, quote, the general perception that the planet is in peril and the reluctance or even outright refusal of some parts of the US government to acknowledge the damaging effects of global warming is likely to play into the hands of extreme environmental and animal rights groups and activists. 
Individuals sympathetic to their ideology or those generally concerned with the welfare of the environment may become increasingly tempted or willing to abandon the customary methods of political dissent. So in essence, the state is worried that its own inaction on climate change and other environmental problems might create resistance. So rather than act on the general perception that the planet is in peril, the state would rather target people who care and call them terrorists. The terrorist label is being used to instill fear. It's being used to discredit the legitimacy of the environmental movement and dissent in general. So I ask, why is the destruction of an SUV, or a ski lodge for that matter, more noteworthy than the removal of a mountaintop or the extinction of a species? What makes an individual act of resistance more heinous than crimes committed by governments and multinational corporations? The Willamette River that runs behind my house has public warnings against eating fish out of the river due to mercury poison and other industrial pollutants. So you tell me who the real goddamn eco-terrorists are. It's necessary that we challenge the government's attack on activists. We must recognize that the purpose of long sentences, terrorist labels, and grand juries are to break the will of the individual and therefore break the back of our movement. But the opposite is also true. When we refuse to cooperate with the state, when we refuse to buy into the hype and disavow direct action, and instead we organize prisoner support, we organize to resist grand juries, when we organize with other struggles to resist oppression, we then reaffirm our individual and collective strength. We develop solidarity and we solidify that commonality of resistance that ties all of our struggles together, be they earth, animal, or human liberation. Right now, the government controls the public image of us. We simply can't allow that to happen. This battle is way too big for us to let them define who we are. We must organize to resist oppressive laws that label dissent terrorism. We must demand state and world body of our prisoners as political prisoners. It is by achieving political recognition of our prisoners that we gain legitimacy as a movement. And that's a powerful tool. And it's the very reason why for four decades the government has labeled us terrorists. The government does not want people to question the legitimacy of direct action. The government doesn't want any public input on any of their policies at all. It might seem odd that I as an anarchist and a fairly obvious opponent of the state, would be so focused on gaining recognition from the same state and world bodies that have oppressed us. However, as a former political prisoner, I know what it means both personally and politically to be granted political status. I know how my life changed when the Eugene Human Rights Commission and Amnesty International decried my sentence as politically motivated. Soon after those announcements, the US media began to use my name and the words political prisoner in the same sentence thus helping to change public perceptions of the radical environmental struggle in myself. I no longer had to justify my actions. For the first time, the media began to seek my opinions on climate change and climate change policy. In fact, the growing attention of my case in the media, in particular their attention to the question of whether or not my 22-year sentence was political, became such a threat to the state's claim that I'm a terrorist that the Oregon Department of Corrections soon began to deny media direct access to me. In order for them to do this, they had to change Oregon law. They rewrote the law to say that the media could be denied access to a prisoner when that access did not serve the prisoner's rehabilitation. So in other words, the fact that even mainstream media had begun to recognize that there was a legitimate motivation for my illegal actions and that I was being punished not for those actions but for the reasons I committed them somehow hindered my rehabilitation. The Department of Corrections even went so far as to place me in disciplinary segregation because my writings continued to appear in print. I was told that if I continued to write or speak about my politics or personal beliefs that I would be kept in isolation. Fortunately for me, all the state's efforts backfired when the Civil Liberties Defense Center threatened to file a lawsuit for the violation of my civil rights and when the media itself began to question why I was being kept silent. And that only reinforces to me that our words are powerful. The state has and will continue to do all that it can to silence us. It will turn us against each other, it will discredit us with lies and declarations of terrorism, and it will throw us in prison. They threw me in a maximum security prison with a 22-year sentence hanging over my head. I was subject to constant harassment by the FBI and prison authorities. The Deputy Attorney General of Oregon, in an effort to keep me in prison, 
compared my actions to Al-Qaeda and Saddam Hussein's invasion of court. <laughs> yep, it's a court document. And still they couldn't silence me. And like the people that you're going to hear up here, we refuse to be silent. But it's important that you recognize that I'm not special and I'm not unique. I am just like every other person in this room. You wouldn't be here listening to this if you didn't care. You're sitting in this room today because you care. And the same force that drives us to stand for something larger than ourselves must also serve as our strength in the face of oppression. We choose to create change not because it's easy, but because we know it's right. Because we are capable of seeing the truth and discerning right and wrong. It's our honor and our integrity that inspires people and touches their hearts. It is our courage in the face of absolute power and our unwavering strength that our enemies must come to fear the most. We must never doubt our power. We only need to know our strengths and learn to protect our weaknesses for us to become an unstoppable force. And the first step is to acknowledge that courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is finding the strength to overcome fear. And each and every one of us in this room today has that strength. Each of us is capable of making an impact. It doesn't matter what you give, as long as you give of yourself. All around the world, people are standing up against corporate tyranny and government oppression. Across this nation, people are standing up. But we're not standing united. We remain separated by single-issue struggles without placing them in a larger context. All of our struggles are connected. Each of us struggling for justice is struggling against the same corrupt system. The system that allows cops to kill an unarmed black man is the same system that protects corporate polluters. It's the same system that labels young sign-carrying activists as terrorists. The system that exploits and oppresses poor people, people of color, women, gays, lesbians, animals, and the earth is the same fucking system and that's not going to change until we change it. Solidarity is more than just a word, it is an action. The world will not be changed because of one struggle. It will not be changed by one direct action or one lawsuit. We're not going to change the world by lobbying, voting, or by marching in the streets. It is not until we use all of these tactics for all of our struggles in conjunction with each other that we will find success. You came here today to listen to several of us speak. And I hope when you leave here today, you'll do your own talking. I hope that you're inspired to work together and to act, because more than anything, what we need right now is action. And there is no action more valuable than another. You give what you can give, and you can combine it with what others can give. What matters most of all is that we stop just thinking about how we want the world to be, and we start working towards making it a reality. We have to work together to weave a movement of every struggle and every tactic if we want to create true change. We have to decide that we are stronger united than separated. Because once we realize that, we become powerful. And when we decide that we will not stop struggling until we have achieved true change, well, hell, when we do that, we become unstoppable. Thank you all for coming today. Yeah.